I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. I'm here with our guest, Dr. Jason Karlowish, for our third installment on the problem of Alzheimer's disease. It's still a problem, Jason, and we have not solved it, though you've nicely described its origins in your book. I'm not going to do your bio again, so instead I'll share some fun facts that you haven't mentioned in any of your prior interviews or essays. Two of them. You are a dedicated distance swimmer with hopeful plans of swimming in our own lakes here in Madison, Wisconsin, Lake Winona in particular, and you raise whippets. So I guess my first question is, what got you into raising whippets? <laughs> uh, when I met my uh, husband, John, he had a whippet named Zoe. And uh, so I suddenly got to discover this most charming breed of dogs. And then after that, it was uh, Juno and then Daisy and Sunny, not named simultaneously, but uh, that's the way it worked out. So currently we have Daisy. Um, and uh, yeah, just so it's our fourth whippet. <laughs> 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 That's wonderful. Well, so in our prior two episodes, we covered the history of Alzheimer's disease, the science, as well as the culture, society, and political influences on it. So today, we're going to discuss our healthcare system's role in Alzheimer's disease, or as you call it in your book, the House of Alzheimer's. Now, you, yeah. you depict a part of our healthcare system in telling a story of two of your patients, Beverly and Darren Johnson. In that story, you ask them a profound question. Why should life be any different now? So I'd like to start by asking you, what did they say to you when you asked them that? And what did they teach you in your time with them? Um, well, you know, life for them was different because they had encountered such poor care in the healthcare system up to that, namely the hunt for a diagnosis. Um and also the stigmas that surrounded the disease, uh, namely, we're not just going to talk, we're just not going to talk about it. And so, you know, the challenge that um, we face at the Memory Center is helping people to overcome those stigmas, um, be able to talk about the problems, make sense of them, and then provide them the education and training that they need to put together a day that's safe, social, and engaged. And in some sense, I've come to see this as kind of like acknowledging their disabilities and what are the reasonable accommodations are going to be needed to address those disabilities. And of course, I think as you and I both know, given our clinical practices, you know, we have a healthcare system that's not really set up to provide those reasonable accommodations so that people can live well, despite of and with a diagnosis of um, dementia caused by Alzheimer's or whatever other disease may be the cause. Well, that's a nice transition to what do we need in healthcare to better care for the people with Alzheimer's disease or any cause of cognitive impairment? Yeah. And there the geriatrician in me really came out in, back in that part three of the book, Living Well in the House of Alzheimer's. And, you know, I called it the House of Alzheimer's, which actually for a while was going to be the title of the whole book. Um, and it was a good working title. I've really come to appreciate working titles. The... Um, the geriatrician, though, in me came out, you know, there are things we can do right now. And in some places we're doing them and slowly Medicare in particular is coming around to making them the, the norm rather than the exception. But, you know, I mean, I start out in the book with just a basic thing, which is, you know, setting up a clinical infrastructure so people can get diagnosis and access to care. Um, you know, you and I both have memory or part of memory centers that are made possible because of large grants, frankly, as well as some philanthropy and cross subsidies. You know, that's just not a sustained business model. Um, you know, I could only find one memory center out in the community that is not a clinical trial shop. And I profile the work of Dr. Peggy Knoll and her memory center in Asheville, North Carolina. But we need to create a, um, an, a, a financial model that allows memory centers, dementia centers to exist. Um, but that's just the start. You know, I talk in the book how, um, you know, access to core long term care services and supports needs to be made possible, namely, you know, there just aren't enough adult day activity programs out there because again, the money isn't there to sustain them. And so they struggle. Um, and then I go to the hospital, you know, and, um, 
you know, what are the, I like to say that uh, delirium is to Alzheimer's as pain is to cancer, you know, um, and we need to think about restructuring the way we run hospitals to uh, implement the proven techniques from the HELP program that Sharon Inouye developed, and I profile her story, um, that can reduce the risks of developing delirium. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 there's more there. We could talk about the, the hip fracture work and whatnot. You want to go there too? <laughs> I, actually, I do want to get into delirium, but let me let me stop and just ask this too, though. As you talk about memory centers and 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 care needed, do we need specialists to treat and address Alzheimer's disease, or can this be done in a primary care oriented environment? I I think it's both. I think much like um, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, there certainly is. Um, a vast number of, of patients for whom the general internist with enough resources can do the work that needs to be done to provide the care. But just like with cardiovascular disease, and I remember back when I used to do general geriatrics, I had patients who I would refer to cardiology because things just weren't going the direction I thought they should go in. Um, I think that uh, the problem right now that general internists face is certainly for some, it's a question of the skills, but even for those who have the skills, there's just some fundamental resources that are almost kind of comic that they need. I say comic because they're so basic, like an exam room that has enough chairs, um, a few extra minutes in a visit so that they can actually talk to the family member and get history, uh, which of course means reimbursement that's appropriate um, because you're taking more time. Um, you know, I, 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 there are some things as I look back, I wish I had in the book. I mean, I spent a fair amount of time, unfortunately, via phone talking with folks in um, the Netherlands. I, not, uh, I wasn't able to make the trip there and learned all about how there um, that's the system they have. It's expected that the primary care physician is adequately resourced to work up a cognitive complaint, um, adequately resourced, meaning they can divide up the, 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 the assessment over a few visits so they can take the time that's needed. And they know when to refer, and that referral network is available to attend a specialty clinic for, you know, and you and I both know the kind of cases we're talking about, language presentations, visual spatial presentations of the disease that are just harder to work up until you're, you know, ha have a real comfort with the sort of cognitive neurology aspect of it. Yeah. And then flipping to the specialist part, so geriatricians, neurologists, geriatric psychiatrists, you know, these aren't, there's not a lot in each of these fields that specialize within memory. And frankly, for geriatrics like you and I, this is not a very popular field. So where do we get this workforce to help provide care for people with cognitive change? Yeah, we have a problem. I mean, the average neurologist does not graduate from a residency program skilled in diagnosis and treatment of persons with, living with dementia. So to a psychiatrist, and frankly, I think, you know, my, I, as a geriatrician, I will say, you know, uh, we're good with some aspects of dementia care and, and diagnosis, but we have wide gaps. So there really is going to need to be a crash course, I think, in learning here for the professions. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm afraid that, you know, we're to blame for that. I mean, you know, doctors are economic actors and the incentive systems since Medicare's founding in 65 were not aligned to promote um, a, a clinical practice particularly in the outpatient setting that addressed the problems of aging adults, um, particularly the problem of dementia, um, the problem of Alzheimer's. You know, I, I think if there's one outcome of this miserable pandemic is that we have learned now about telemedicine and its possibilities, as well as, as, well as teleeducation. I mean, I can't wait to get back in person and live with colleagues to learn, but I also have learned the value of you know, remote techniques for lectures and things. So I have a cautious optimism that we may begin to create hub and spoke models for telemedicine and teleeducation to begin to sort of jigger the workforce uh, so that they can provide the care that's desperately needed. I appreciate that cautious optimism. Yeah. And, and now going now going back to the memory centers, because I think that's such a huge piece of this. You know, how do we get more memory centers in our healthcare system? And then how do these centers function within the, the current system that we have of healthcare? Well, we're going to have to spend some money to save some money. I mean, I, I just think that um, uh, one cautiously optimistic um, event that's occurring on the national level is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMMS, has created what's known as Comprehensive Primary Care, which is uh, otherwise known as CPC. It's still a demonstration project, but you can clearly see that they 
want to encourage healthcare systems, and the emphasis there is on systems to identify persons with Alzheimer's disease and related disorder diagnoses and provide the kind of comprehensive care they need um, with, for example, the introduction of things like care managers, uh, mental health services, et cetera. So, you know, I'm, when I look at this uh, uh, CPC program, you know, literally go to the website, it, it's meritorious. It's got the right intention. The question is, of course, you know, getting it out there and making it work economically. And I will tell you, I've had chats with folks who, you know, run or otherwise are senior leaders in healthcare systems. And there's a little fear about this kind of approach because it all does truly come down to money. I mean, you know, uh, you know, knee replacements still are the, the, the golden ticket, you know, for a healthcare system to make money. And, you know, it just makes no sense. If you look at the events of COVID, the hospitals were packed, packed with patients, and yet they lost money. There's something wrong there. There's just something wrong that you've got a system set up that even though your hospital was filled to the gun, to the, to the roof, you lost it shows you that we that the, the craziness of the incentive systems we've created. And then speaking of hospitals being full, delirium happens for quite frequently in a hospital. And you do spend quite a bit of time in your book talking about delirium and capacity. So both really key components. And so share with our audience why that matters in a book about Alzheimer's disease. Well, you know, I like to say that, you know, delirium is to Alzheimer's as pain is to cancer. You know, um, not all people with pain have cancer, but boy, if there's one symptom, one complication of cancer that we all know about, it's pain. And indeed, this country engaged in an almost bizarre, you know, let's make pain the fifth vital sign and the rest is this, the history of the opioid epidemic. Well, um, in contrast, you know, uh, not certainly patients, persons develop the delirium, acute confusional episodes with either characterized by lethargy or agitation from a variety of different um, insults to their brain. And many, some don't have any, you know, cognitive problems. But I think you and I both know, and the literature amply documents that having cognitive impairment, having dementia is a big risk factor for developing delirium because you're admitted for a heart attack, a urinary tract infection a fall with a fracture, whatever. And I mean, the, 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 I, and I went to the source, I interviewed Sharon Inouye and, and learned her story of, of becoming a, uh, one of the first scientists dedicated to studying delirium. And she really worked out, you know, what was otherwise considered just, this is just what happens to older adults. And she, much like senility, you know, it's just what happens. And she said, no, this doesn't have to be that way. And her work was very clever. She identified the risk factors and most importantly, she showed if you manipulate those risk factors, you can reduce the risk of getting delirium. So she turned something that just was like the winter. There's nothing you can do about it into something that is tractable. Um, in that sense, I think she's one of the heroes of the book. And in your book, you often mention the importance of team. You have a team in your memory clinic. I have a team. So what does a multidisciplinary team offer and why does it matter in aging and particularly in dementia? Yeah, you know, I, I had a revelation when I w wrote that part of the book. It's a chapter called Discernment, and I picked that title, Discernment. It's actually, uh, I'll get to just that in a minute, because I realized that a lot of these innovations um, were about creating multidisciplinary teams. Now, and, 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 you know, of course, we say that, we all nod. It's sort of a virtue kind of rhetoric, you know, who doesn't want a multidisciplinary team? It sounds so good, you know, but what's going on there is, is a change of culture. You know, and, 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 and that's what um, uh, I think we're talking about when we're talking about multidisciplinary teams. We're saying that the ways that we have organized care, the ways we think about providing care um, are, 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 are wrong. And we have to arrive at a, a recognition that we need to work with other people in different ways. OK, that's the process of discernment. And, and, I, and that word actually comes from a, a Jesuit tradition of sort of a perfecting of one's character and soul to recognize one's faults in a kind of endless process of sort of recognition, you know, cor and correction. I guess it's a process of in the Jesuit uh, novicery of discernment. And, and, I, and, I, and that's what I think the healthcare systems need to do. I mean, they were working in teams when they were taking care of my grandfather, who they potentially killed after his hip fracture, but it was a crazy team. It was a team that was well aligned to make sure he had the best post best surgery and you know his hip was repaired and worked well anesthesia surgery you know it was the team but it wasn't the right team and and that's this culture change that needs to occur different teams thinking differently 
Uh, and that's this process of discernment. Very powerful word. I didn't I didn't appreciate it when I read it in your book. I appreciate it now. You 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 talked earlier about the activity center and in and in your book you you talk about adult activity centers or daycare centers whatever terms you want to use uh, and you illustrate the power of such things and I really like your example of a beanbag toss yeah so so can you comment for our listeners what services supports non medication related do you envision for a better care system. Well, several, but one that I foreground in the book is adult day activity programs. You're right, also sometimes called adult daycare, a term that I think just doesn't work on a number of levels. Um, It is about activity, and so that probably is the better term for it. And I visited one of them. I visited Mainline Adult Day uh, Program in the Mainline of Philadelphia, and, and Pat, who ran it, you know, took me on a tour. And it was so impressive to meet her and her dedicated staff um, uh, creating a space that was safe, social, and engaged for individuals with um, cognitive impairment. And, you know, one of the revelatory moments when I was there was when she talked about how, you know, many families typically come too late. Um, they've been reluctant to participate. Um, and often when they come there, the one, some things that, one thing that many of them say in was sort of a rueful kind of, you know, dark humor is, you know, I don't want my dad playing beanbag toss or they just comment on that. And and, and she says, it's so ironic because if there's one activity, which we find really brings out the residents enjoyment and engagement, it's beanbag toss because it's a team activity that, you know, there's some degree of competition. It's cognitive engaging. You got to keep track of the score, who's winning and it's physically engaging, standing, tossing, et cetera. And, you know, and she just, point, I, I was so moved by that, that I put it in the book, which is the need to kind of, you have to just see this world differently um, and, and, and get over the stigmas as well. I mean, I understand the stigma of a son dropping off his father who once upon a time was a leading professor in, in the university and now is enjoying playing beanbag toss. I mean, I, I understand the mourning that that family member experiences and yet, and yet his father enjoys that activity. Um, You know, uh, that mainline adult daycare shut down. Um, It shut down because COVID uh, obviously kept people away and they simply didn't have the resources. Um, It's so sad, you know, to just sort of sustain things as they managed. You know, they weren't part of the healthcare system as most of them are. That is the case. And so, you know, they had a limited endowment, limited reserve. And, you know, maybe they'll get back going again now that we're back together again slowly in the region here. But I just thought that was such a sad day. It's not in the book, obviously. It's just a sad day in the mall you know, that these activity programs are out there in the community struggling, you know, uh, to, to, to basically make salary and sustain themselves. And yet they provide such good. You know, your response makes me think of when, when I am with fellows and residents and med students, you know, I always want to train them to be respectful of people with dementia. They're human beings, you, you know, respect their autonomy, their individuality, and don't treat them like a baby. And, and that's a really important thing. And you mentioned that in your, your book about the language that we use. And so sometimes I fear we swing too far and we just assume that older people can't have fun or play games. And I experience that in clinic when I talk about adult coloring and the, and the value of potentially coloring pictures and how that can be actually mindful and stimulating and yet calming. And so it seems like we just have to find this balance between being respectful, not babying people, but at the same time, allowing them to toss a beanbag and have fun. Yeah, but I I do think it does come down to being respectful through communication. I actually have have a whole chapter, not legally dead yet. It's about capacity assessment, but it's really about communication. And I I will say, you know, I don't I don't do um, hospital based um, uh, uh, care anymore. Um, But when I did, I would spend some time with the residents, really having them scrutinize the way that they spoke with the older adults. And um, I once had a very vigorous exchange with a resident who felt, well, they're so scared. And, and, and if we talk to them like, you know, with the, talk to them like this so that they don't feel so scared, you know, uh, that that's a good thing. And I, I and I said, well, I acknowledge there may, you may walk into a room and have a social connection, an emotional connection with someone where you realize they're panicked and you need to use a soothing tone of voice. But the default ought to be you talk to adults like adults. 
um, at a tone of voice, like I'm talking to you right now. Um, and phrases like he's so cute to describe an older adult. I just think that is so inappropriate. I just, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I think start with the default of you talk to adults like adults. If you develop a relationship such that calling them cute and whatnot seems to where you're going to go with it, so be it. But to make the default a sing-songy, baby talk, high-pitched, you're so cute. I, I just find that the beginning of it, it's an othering is what it usually reflects is the discomfort of, this, of the interlocutor with the other person. And, and, and yeah, I, I think that's incredibly important for um, uh, dignity and quality communication. And also in your book, then, you, you do meet this very innovative physician, uh, Dr. Jeff Kay. And you write about the use of technology, and he's monitoring people, he's helping people. Yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was something. So what did you learn from that experience? And do you think that that method is practical? Yeah, so Jeff Kay at Oregon Health Sciences University has what's called OrcaTech. And uh, what Jeff, Jeff's a neurologist who, um, you know, doing, was doing standard biomarker type research etc. And he went to this conference uh, somewhere in uh, the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, where, um, you know, Intel and other tech folks were there. And he suddenly had this revelation, like, why aren't we using this technology to gather the data that we otherwise spend our time in these incredibly artificial interviews with informants asking them to recall things that are full of biases, etc. Why don't we just, you know, function is the problem. Let's measure function. And the rest is history. And he has set up this living laboratory. And I visited some of the apartments right next to um, OHSU, Oregon Health Sciences University, that are all wired up, if you will, where you can detect motion through the build, the room, uh, time spent on the bed, um, uh, use of uh, 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 the uh, medication box, uh, refrigerator opening time, uh, driving habits in terms of you know frequency out on the road, uh, et cetera. I mean, it really is quite uh, computer use, you know, time spent on the computer. Um, I bring that one up because he has a great paper that shows a predictor of developing mild cognitive impairment is decline in the amount of time people spend on the computer. Um, and so the point is, is that, you know, we can, there's so much of our lives, courtesy of the Internet of Things, that can be monitored to both detect and then monitor cognitive impairment. And, you know, he's doing it. The, the challenge, of course, is you know, in, in interconnecting these various different kinds of light bulbs and whatnot in a system that, you know, will work. And then, of course, there's fabulous challenges related to how we're going to use this information in our clinical practice. And I talk about how it upends the way we communicate because, you know, now you come to me and I ask you questions to find out what's going on. In a future world, I get a, I get a, a, a report about how you've been doing, and I have to figure out how to engage you in a discussion of what I've observed about your driving habits and whatnot. Um, but I mean, I, let's rise to that challenge and face it. Yeah, the, 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 I have great hope that uh, technology can be a way to allow us to live independently. Um, of course, we're going to have to surrender some privacy to, the, to, do, to achieve that. And to end this episode, I'd like to talk about what you call hope in a plan. So as I read this section, this showed me the power, the influence of political and social organizations putting needed pressure on our government to act. And so what role does our government have in addressing this humanitarian crisis and what steps have they made so far? Hope in a plan was one of the most fun chapters to write, um, also to research. Um, and uh, it's a great story of, of politics in, in the grandest sense of politics, namely activists, non-scientists um, realized, you know, we're not making progress against this disease. We simply are not putting enough money into the research and we're tinkering with our, um, our healthcare system, throwing a little bit of money, creating programs that then disappear, et cetera. And we really need to take this problem on. And what the activists realized, though, was that the approaches that they were taking just weren't working. And that we're talking around about like 2005 uh, here to up to about 2011 when things break uh, with the past signage of the National Alzheimer's Project Act by President Obama. And what I chronicle and hope on a plan is the work of two <coughs> individuals who led organizations. One is George Vradenberg, who ran, runs an organization called Us Against Alzheimer's, and the other is Harry Johns, who's was and is the president CEO of the Alzheimer's Association. And I chronicle, I, in, I think, kind of meticulous detail, having interviewed both as well as others around them, how, you know, they, they went about 
um, working with Congress to try and change funding. And what's interesting without spoiling the story is they ultimately um, went about it in two very different ways. And Harry Johns emerges really as kind of the, the hero of the story, if you will, because he decided along with Bob Aggie, uh, Robert, excuse me, Robert Aggie of um, the association's um, uh, lobbying group, uh, the AIM, Alzheimer's Impact Movement, to adopt a very different strategy. And, and they were they were brilliant. I mean, and it led to the passage of the National Alzheimer's Project Act and therefore an enormous increase in federal funding for research, which remains today, as well as the beginning of a reorientation of the federal government around how they approach Alzheimer's disease. I think that's an unfinished, the latter is an unfinished project, um, which I think remains, we'll see. I think the next key event in our history is going to be what happens in the midterms and the balance within the House and Senate in order to move legislation forward that's going to make a difference here. Well, thank you for your insights, Jason. I'm hopeful more change is coming and books like yours are going to lead to these changes through you know, active discussion. We have one more discussion left, and I think it'll be the most interesting. I'm going to ask Dr. Karlowish to lay out what he thinks society can do to help this humanitarian problem that we call Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to delve into wealth care, creative strategies to care for others, and the important issue of stigma. So tune in to hear more. Please subscribe to Dementia Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. And rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Bashir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.